Okay, good morning. Um, we can get going while people s continue to straggle in. Um, so I'm Brent Gravely. I'm going to be the moderator for this session and, and the first speaker. But first I'd like to just um, thank the members of the Data Coordination Center who have really put a lot of work into organizing this meeting. I think they've done a, a fabulous job and hopefully making it a great experience for all of the users. So. Yes, especially Gene. Not that anybody, yeah, everybody else has done a lot of work. But, and for also having a very good music list during the breaks. So, okay. Um, so as I said, I'm, um, my name is, oh, we need to get to the beginning here. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, so my name is Brent Gravely. I'm one of the, the production PIs within the ENCODE project, and I'd like to uh, thank myself for inviting me to talk to you today. <laughs> um, but what I'd like to talk to you about is a, a project that we've been uh, working on, characterizing the, the functional, this worked a minute ago. Okay, the functional RNA elements uh, in the, the human uh, genome, and this is a new component of the ENCODE project. So during uh, the past, a few phases. Uh, we're currently in phase three uh, of ENCODE, which is ending in the, the next few months here. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, figures from the previous publications from ENCODE, um, and part of why I like it is that it um, highlights sort of the diversity of cell types and assays uh, that have been done. And um, so one, the other reason I like it is you can see here um, in RNA binding proteins, there's actually very few proteins or cell types or assay types that were actually conducted. Um, yet RNA binding proteins are really an important part of the biology of the genomes. Um, in fact, there was a paper uh, recently published in Science from Jonathan Pritchard's lab um, highlighting that RNA splicing is one of the primary links between genetic variation and human disease. Uh, so this is a really great paper, so go read it. Um, but it's highlighting the really important aspect of RNA biology in, in human disease. So there's many aspects of RNA biology uh, th that are, uh, occur when you synthesize a pre-mRNA. Uh, these are then spliced. They can undergo RNA editing. Uh, they can have cleavage and polydenylation at the three prime ends. And then these RNAs are either retained in the nucleus or exported to the cytoplasm uh, where they become translated. And then they can be localized within the cytoplasm to different regions and they can be also controlled at the level of RNA stability. And each of these steps can be controlled by a large number of RNA binding proteins. Um, and these proteins recognize elements within the RNA. So for instance, uh, proteins involved in splicing can bind to intronic or exonic elements that can either enhance or repress splicing of a particular exon. Uh, proteins involved in polydenylation can bind to either exons or they can bind downstream of the cleavage and polyadenylation site and they can either enhance or repress use of a particular poly A site. And then proteins can also bind to many different regions of a messenger RNA and they can control the translation, the localization of that RNA or the stability of, of that RNA. And so we're really in this project trying to identify the binding sites for, for all of these proteins. Uh, and, and this is a figure that was um, published in Cell several years ago highlighting the proteins that people knew of at the time that could regulate splicing. And there's maybe 30 or 40 proteins on this list, but there's over 100,000 alternative splicing events that occur in the human genome. So there's no way that only 40 proteins can regulate all of those splicing events. And in fact, censuses that uh, our group and others have done uh, over the last few years suggest that there's at least 1,000 up to possibly 2,000 different RNA binding proteins. Yet only a handful of these proteins have ever really been characterized in, in much detail. And these proteins are involved in uh, nearly every aspect of RNA biology within the cell. So there's many different complexes and processes that go on within the nucleus. Um, and the cytoplasm, and there's many different categories of uh, RNA protein complexes. Okay, so the goal of the project that we're engaged in is to comprehensively identify the elements in the human genome that are recognized by these RNA binding proteins. Um, in the current phase, uh, our goal is to do this for 250 different uh, RNA binding proteins, and eventually we would like to get to doing all of them. Uh, we also want to characterize the binding affinity of each protein to all possible RNA sequences, uh, 
and then determine the functions of these protein and RNA interactions. And so the way that we think of this conceptually is sort of like developing something like a periodic table for human RNA binding proteins, where for each protein we're going to have the same sets of assays that are conducted in the same uh, manner and the same cell types so that you can actually directly compare them and every protein will have the same uh, data sets uh, for themselves. So we're creating sort of a reference uh, set for these RNA binding proteins. So for instance, for each protein we'll be doing uh, an assay that Eric uh, van Nostrand introduced called ClipSeq, uh, where we characterize the protein RNA uh, interactions between uh, each of these proteins. Um, we'll uh, also be doing uh, an assay called RNA binding seq, and this is being done by Chris Burge's lab, in which they measure the binding affinity for each RNA binding protein with all possible RNA sequences so that we can then go in and if we see a mutation in a particular patient, you can predict what would happen to the binding of a protein to that particular site. Um, we're also, for a subset of proteins that are uh, localized to the nucleus, we're performing chip seq on them to see how those proteins associate with chromatin. Uh, we're also trying to assess the function of these binding sites, and to do this we're doing uh, either RNAi knockdowns or CRISPR knockouts for these RNA binding proteins followed by RNA-seq so we can see how depleting these proteins impacts the transcriptome. And finally, unlike uh, transcription factors which interact with DNA in the nucleus, we hope, um, RNA binding proteins can function anywhere within the cell. So uh, with the reagents that we're generating for these, we're actually uh, performing uh, immunohistochemistry uh, experiments so we can look at where within the cell each RNA binding protein is. And th these, these experiments are being done by Eric Lecoyer's lab in Canada. Okay, so again, we're going to be defining the binding sites, hopefully identifying the functions of these sites. Uh, one thing we're really interested in once we get a large collection of these is we can start looking at the composition of RNPs. So, so this is sort of the equivalent in the RNA world of chromatin structure. So you can take RNA strands and then start decorating them with the proteins and we can see how individual transcripts are bound by different proteins and how that may impact their function. Uh, we also hope to be able to predict how mutations will impact RNA processing and hopefully us or others will use this data to uh, obtain new insight into RNA biology. So for um, all of these assays that we're doing, that we're conducting them in two different cell lines, the, the K562 cells and the HEPG2 cells, which are um, being extensively studied by others within the ENCODE consortium. I think when you merge the RNA binding protein data with the transcription factor and the DNA methylation and the histone chip seq data, we'll have a very large collection of genetic data that we can hope to really understand how these particular cells work. Okay, so there's over a thousand RNA binding proteins, so uh, how, how do we come up with which ones to study and which ones to prioritize? Um, I'd like to tell you it's this really um, scientific method, but the way we did it was we scoured the earth for antibodies and we started testing them. And so we um, acquired uh, over 800 antibodies for RNA binding proteins. We also have over 1,000 shRNAs to these RNA binding protein genes. And we so far have tested 700 of these in IP Western experiments. And so for each uh, RNA binding protein, we perform an IP with, uh, also with the control. And so we identify those that efficiently immunoprecipitate the protein of interest. And of those, we have uh, 438 antibodies that work. Um, then we also perform for each of these antibodies a secondary characterization to make sure that the, the band that's recognized on the western is actually the protein that you think it is. Uh, we perform uh, shRNA knockdown experiments and we make sure that the band actually goes away when you deplete the transcript. Um, so uh, of these we have uh, so far 362 of these done. Um, and so we have reagents that have passed all of these standards for uh, 276 RNA binding proteins. Um, so for the, the IP Western experiments, we've come up with a, a grading scheme from uh, really good, shown in green, to the really bad antibodies, uh, shown in red. And we're really focusing all of our experiments on the ones uh, shown in green, which are really good antibodies that efficiently IP the protein of interest. And if we look at just those that have good antibodies, uh, this is sort of the domain composition of the proteins within that. So most of them have uh, canonical uh, uh, RNA binding domains. Um, some of them have uh, domains that are known to interact with either DNA or RNA. 
And then there's a bunch of proteins that have other domains which are not typically annotated as an RNA binding protein, but these proteins have been shown to be covalently cross-linkable to RNA, so we're studying them anyway. Um, so the antibody resources, um, are these are all available at the DCC site, so some of this is similar to the DCC uh, tutorials that have been shown on, uh, so you can go there and search for these. Um, we have, uh, there's a large number of them which are in this category called not pursued, and those are the antibodies that are bad. They don't work very well, and we think that information is just as important as the ones that are good, so you don't actually go and order a bad antibody. Um, but so you can identify these, and if you click on a particular antibody, you can see both the IP uh, experiment and the RNAi knockdown experiment. And then also if there are data sets that have been generated to date, you can actually ac access those directly on that site as well. Um, and just like the antibodies where there's a, a gradient of how well these things work, the shRNAs, there, there's a, a gradient for how well those work as well. So some of the shRNAs uh, work e extremely well and deplete the protein very well. Others don't work very well at all. Um, and some proteins, even after trying 10 or 12 shRNAs, don't, can't be depleted. And so for those, we were actually shifting now to using CRISPRs to, to knock those out. Okay, so like I said, for many of these proteins, um, we're all, where we have these antibodies, we're also doing immunostaining of the cells to look at where within the cell these proteins localize. Um, so we have, uh, for each uh, of these antibodies, we're uh, staining with the RBP uh, antibody itself. We have a collection of 10 different markers for different subcellular localizations, and then uh, we merge them, and so this is just an example for three different proteins. Uh, but Eric LeCoyer's lab in Canada has an entire database that you can go to and the URL is, is shown down here, and you can go and search for your favorite antibody or you can just browse the images, and we hope uh, within the next few months to get many of these images over to the DCC. Um, so if you were, for instance, to go in and, and look at a particular protein, this one's uh, AARS, you show the, uh, the antibody staining here, and these are all the different markers, and then we have the, the code labeling of them here. And uh, then you can just sort of browse these, and there's another shot where it'll show the merged images is for all of these. So you should go look at these. They're really amazing images and just fun to look at. Okay. So as far as the, the genomic assays go, um, Eric uh, Van Nostron uh, introduced this to you in, in the workshop the other day. Um, so this is the eClip uh, assay that he developed, and uh, it's a really high throughput assay that's really good at identifying protein RNA interactions that occur in vivo um, and with, with high throughput. And so I won't go through this in, in much more detail since Eric spent the whole workshop on it. Um, but I can sort of give you some highlights for, for some of the types of data that we're getting now. Um, so for instance, we're able to classify different proteins in having different types of uh, binding profiles. So for instance, Proteins such as PRP8, which is a core component of the spliceosome, tends to bind to uh, five prime splice sites preferentially, uh, whereas another spliceosomal protein, U2AF2, binds preferentially to three prime splice sites. There's proteins such as RBFOX2, which binds to intronic sequences, um, IGF2, BP1, which binds to three prime UTRs, and then proteins such as FXR1, which binds to uh, coding exons. And so we can uh, categorize these proteins into these different binding profiles now. Another thing we can do is start to look at co-association. So we can uh, take each protein and ask uh, what are the other proteins that, that we've characterized that have the most similar binding profiles uh, to it. And so we can try and identify uh, co-associated proteins. And so there are things that we know about. Uh, for instance, I think down here in the left bottom corner is a, a group of uh, a cluster that contains both subunits of the protein U2AF, and this is a protein that has two, uh, two subunits and it's a, a very tight heterodimer, and so we're seeing that those two proteins have the same binding profiles. Um, we can also have uh, another mate, uh, cluster here, which has some proteins uh, that we know of that work together, but also other proteins that we ha actually don't know that they work together, but we have never even characterized these proteins. So we can start to look at the functions of these and we can make guesses on what these functions are based on their co-associations with other proteins. 
Um, okay, we can also take this RNA-centered point of view, and, and Eric showed uh, a little bit of this in, in his talk. Uh, for instance, if we look at Exist and the proteins that bind to it, we can see that HNRPK, PTBP1, HNRPM, and SRSF1 bind to the Exist transcript, but they do so with different, uh, in di different locations. Um, similarly, uh, we see a collection of proteins that bind to the uh, non-coding RNA MALAT1. Um, so this is what I was talking about where we can now start to look at RNP structure by uh, really decorating individual transcripts with different RNA binding proteins. Okay, and so just to give an overview, uh, this is just a, 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 a demonstration of sort of how many binding sites we're identifying when we do new assays uh, with these proteins. So if we were here looking at the cumulative number of data sets that have been generated, and on the left uh, panel is the number of peaks that have been identified, and on the right it's the number of nucleotides in the genome that are being covered, and we've done a hundred different iterations of this, basically putting the assays in different orders, and in red shows that the uh, results for hep G2, and in blue it's for K562 cells. Um, so we're still, every time we add a new protein, we're still generating new binding sites that have not been identified uh, in previous assays, and we have a lot of RNA binding proteins to go, I think, before we start saturating this. Okay, another assay that's being done, and this is being done in, in Chris Burgess' lab, is this assay we call RNA bind and seq. Um, and what this is is they take a pool of randomized RNAs and they incubate it with in, uh, recombinant proteins at several different concentrations of those proteins, isolate the bound RNAs, and then sequence them. And then they can look at, they also sequence the input RNA. And so they can look at uh, the enrichment of different uh, hexamers, sevenmers, eightmers, et cetera, and these different binding uh, affinities, and they can actually calculate the relative binding affinity of the protein for these. And they can get out of that the motifs in vitro that these proteins optimally recognize. And so then what we can do is we can intersect those motifs identified from the RNA bind and seq data with the peaks identified from the CLIP data and so we're, when we do that, we're actually able to, this pointer's not working very well. All right, so we, when we do that, we can actually identify the actual motifs within the peaks. Uh, so this provides sort of an orthogonal uh, validation of the, the peaks or the, the motifs identified in the peaks because we're now able to, to cross-reference the bind and seek data with the CLIP data. And this allows us also to sort of pinpoint the binding sites uh, to very high resolution within the transcripts. Um, so another type of assay that we're doing is the uh, knockdown followed by RNA-seq where we can then look and identify exons that change in their splicing, for instance, or gene expression changes that occur after knockdown. And then we can intersect that with the CLIP data. Um, so these are uh, some figures what we call RNA maps. And so what we're doing here, for instance, on the bottom is taking all of the exons uh, that are regulated by this protein RBFOX. And we can separate them into ones where when you knock the protein down, you see inclusion of that exon, or when you knock it down, you see repression of that exon. And then we can uh, look at the binding profiles for RBFOX based on the CLIP data. All right, pointers, okay. Um, and so what we see is uh, it, for the exons that are activated by RBFOX, we tend to see binding of the protein downstream of that particular exon. Uh, and so what we can do now is uh, not just identify the elements that these proteins recognize, but we can partition them into functional categories. Thank you. Okay. Ah, that one's much better. Okay, so, so we're using this now to sort of assign functions to the different RNA elements. Um, so some other use you can uh, get out of this data, so this is a, a, a paper that we published with uh, Chris Burge recently this year, uh, where they identified a set of alternative exons, their alternative last exons, um, and they wanted to identify proteins that would regulate them. So what we're able to do here is, is actually um, highlight proteins uh, that really enhance the utilization of the most distal last exon versus uh, repressing utilization of the most distal exon. So just by scouring through this data, we can come up with really good candidates for proteins that regulate certain types of splicing events. And uh, Grace Zhao in the next talk will actually talk about some of this in, in more detail. <laughs> 
uh, for other types of RNA processing events. Um, another type of experiment we've done is to take cells and we fractionate them in, we have, so we have a total fraction and then we generate subcellular fractions. So we have a nuclear, a cytosolic, a membrane, and an insoluble fraction. And then we can look at where within these fractions different transcripts partition. And so once we have this data, we can start now doing integrative type analysis where we can uh, look at a protein. So this is a protein RBM27. Um, and what we find is this protein actually tends to bind to mitochondrial transcripts uh, more than other transcripts. Uh, and if you look at the imaging, we, it turns out that the protein is very highly localized to mitochondria, which is good. And if we look at the gene expression, genes whose expression changes upon uh, depletion of the protein, uh, it turns out most of these tend to be mitochondrial transcripts as well. And then what we can do is using those fractionation data that we generated, uh, we can sort of partition uh, the data into uh, where they, each transcript tends to uh, localize within those. And then in uh, red and blue, respectively, we can look at the genes that are over and underexpressed upon depletion of those. And these tend to uh, correlate with where the mitochondria migrate within those fractions. Um, so this all provides d evidence that this RBM27 protein is really involved in uh, the function and activity of mitochondrial transcripts. Okay, so here's a snapshot of about where we are to date. Uh, so far we have at least one data set for uh, 344 RNA binding proteins. So we have about 1,300 data sets that are completed and or released. Um, and as I said, they're in both K562 and HEPG2. And uh, so these are the numbers for individual data sets. And what we're really trying to do, work on now in the next few months is trying to maximize the number of assays that are uh, available for each protein. And our goal is to sort of all these black squares, hopefully fill as many of those in as we can. So we have the same data for, for every RNA binding protein. And then eventually we'll be able to have our periodic table for RNA binding proteins. Okay, so, um, so this is a, a lot of work from a large people. So my lab is at UConn. Uh, these are the people in, involved in, in my lab. Chris Burge's lab is doing all of the RNA binding seq uh, experiments. Uh, Gene Yao's lab is uh, really spearheading all of the CLIP data, doing a lot of heroic work, uh, is really led by Eric Van Nostron. Um, uh, Eric LeCoyer's lab is, is involved in the imaging data. Uh, Fu's lab is doing some chick seq data that I didn't really talk about. Uh, we're collaborating closely with Grace Yao, and I have to thank the Data Coordination Center for working with us very closely on getting all the data in there so that you can ha have access to it. And I have to thank uh, NHGRI for funding. So thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. Maybe you already mentioned this. Uh, do you have a, a sense of how many binding proteins bind to the sequence element and how many bind to the structure, secondary or tertiary structure? Um, I, I don't have I don't have numbers for you, but um, there are, so there are a lot. Of, I would say most of the proteins that have, for instance, uh, RNA recognition motifs, they tend to bind to particular sequences. Um, but some of those do so within a structured context. So this, the, the sequence would have to be a single-stranded sequence, but it's in the loop of a stem loop, for instance. Uh -huh. But the actual sequence of the stem is irrelevant as long as it forms a structure that displays the, the binding site within a loop. And the right. example would be excess RNA, which binds proteins, yeah. not at the same place. Yeah, and then there's, there's double-stranded RNA binding proteins uh, that we're, we're looking at, so those tend to bind to, obviously, double-stranded RNA. Um, there's also a lot of proteins that just seem to coat RNA, so they don't really, they, there may be like one site that's like a, a sort of a nucleating, nucleating site, site yeah. and then it just sort of coats from there. And so most of the sites for some proteins are pretty nonspecific. Thank you. So there's a one over there. Oh, oh, the, you already have the mic. <coughs> okay, <laughs> Emily, you don't. Have Go ahead. So uh, perhaps it's a very nice question, but um, do, you 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 make an analogy with the uh, RNA elements versus the DNA elements. Is there anything similar as this, uh, you know, communication that we know now with with the histone marks in the DNA elements, uh, something similar in the RNA elements, like a long distance uh, 
like interactions within the proteins and the RNA bound? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. So, so, we're, so we have information on protein RNA interactions and some of those will be occurring within the nucleus and some will be in the cytoplasm. So the nuclear ones could be sort of interacting at the chromatin level. Uh, so for some of those proteins, uh, Foo's lab is also doing chip seek, so we can sort of get an idea of like where the protein is um, on that. Um, but there are other other groups that are also working on um, sort of a, a chip seek like assay that instead of just sequencing DNA, will sequence both the RNA and DNA that's bound. So sort of like a chia pet high C type thing where you're looking at protein protein mediated RNA DNA interactions. Um, so we're not doing that ourselves, but I know there are other groups that are doing that, and that would probably be the best way to address that question. <coughs> and uh, even more general, uh, so what is the, uh, the role that those RNA elements, or in general those, uh, yeah, RNA and proteins play versus the gene preservation? Because it's like, it seems like two different worlds, but they, they interact, right? Um, yeah, so, so there's some experiments uh, uh, showing that there's, Proteins, so for instance, like the HIV TAT protein will bind to the TAR element and it sort of reaches back to the promoter and enhances transcription. So that's sort of one way in which uh, some sort of protein RNA mediated interaction in the nucleus could occur to interact with the, the transcription machinery to enhance it. I think a lot of these are also involved in regulating translation or transcription elongation. They could regulate transcription termination so I think there's a lot of different ways in which this could work and hopefully us and others will be able to figure this out. So Jason. I was wondering um, if and how much signal you see outside of annotated genes with RNA. Um, outside of annotated genes? Yeah. Um, so I would say there's very little signal outside of annotated genes. Um, I mean, there's some, but I would say the vast majority of it is in something that's annotated or at least within the intron of an annotated gene. So we see very little signal uh, throughout the genome outside of where we know transcription occurs in these particular cells. So. For the okay. <clears throat> yeah, for the proteins that are clustering together, are they binding the same sequence and then competing, or are they part of the same complex? Um, so, so it seems like for the most part they're binding or they're, they're forming a complex and then they bind together. So, so they'll actually have different binding sites, yeah. but they're binding as a complex right. together. So can you say how many complexes there are then um, from your data roughly? Um, we probably could. I don't know a number off the top of my head. But okay. All right. One more. They're way back there. And then we should probably move on. Have you looked at all at RNA editing uh, using the like uh, total RNA seq data? That's an excellent segue. In fact, our next speaker <laughs> will talk precisely about that. So, yeah. So Jiping, we can catch up. But yeah. I'm, so we'll move on so we can keep on time. Um, so I'm introduce the next speaker, which is Grace Zhao, and she will actually talk about the these RNA binding proteins, how they control splicing, and possibly editing today. I know she's working on it. So.